Hi. Um, my name is Bas Wisseling. I come from Amsterdam. I live here. Um, I'm part of the Next Foundation, or a bit less glorious Stichting Next here in uh, here in Amsterdam. We've just been based in A Labs across uh, Central Station in the A, which is for us a very good location because we're amongst a lot of other startups, which is. I think for a cryptocurrency, one of the best places to be because just a blockchain is not enough. You need something to use it for. And this is one of the, uh, probably one of the biggest challenges for blockchain uh, technology that we will get in the coming years. Um, to put it in perspective, I think the World Economic Forum talked about blockchain technology being deployed globally in 2027. I just heard that this morning. So that's 11 years from now, not a long way to go. What kind of blockchain technology? I'm not talking about which brand or which kind of blockchain, but what kind of blockchain technology that's open to history, to coming history, I think. So I'm not talking Bitcoin against Next or Next against, uh, against BitShares or whatever kind. I'm just talking about, for instance, the difference between permissionless and permissioned, which will, for the coming years, be a big one. Are we going towards blockchains that are still under the control of another party? Or are we going towards blockchains that are completely decentralized, open, and anyone can get in? So just to put it in perspective on the, on the things when I talk about use cases, because you will see that kind of mix coming along, probably. Just a question, because um, I don't know the composition of the crowd. Who's completely new to cryptocurrency or blockchain technology? You have admirable. You were admirable then in the first talk because you got a really big load of technical stuff all over you. I'm trying to get back from the technical to what can you do with it, and I'm just going to show you um, a few things that are being built on our platform. That's my criminal picture. Um, let me see, because I now need to restart everything, it seems, but luckily I did it this way. Um, let me just, no, sorry. Okay, um, while I'm doing this, um, because it shut down for some reason, one of the uh, key things about Next that makes it diff what we are doing differently from, well, let's say, for instance, uh, Bitcoin is when you see uh, things in Bitcoin at the moment, um, most of most the most prominent use case is Bitcoin still used as a currency. What we see happening now in uh, the Bitcoin uh, in Bitcoin-based uh, economy is that we see separate use cases that have nothing uh, to do with the currency side. Because, and the reason for this is that it is not a blockchain can do much more than just move uh, tokens that can be used as coins. A blockchain has also been called a, a decentralized database. And I think that's a bit overstating it because many people have already said in, decentralization does not mean efficiency. And if you store large amounts of data on a blockchain and you try to retrieve it to your system, it's not the best way to do it. So if I want to have one gigabyte at current speed, I will still have to wait for a long time. But for small amounts of data, it is very, um, it is very good. Ah, there we get it. Okay, so this is what Next uh, tries to do. So coming from the place that you have a blockchain in which on blocks you can store 
data, information, and that information uh, is witnessed by a huge amount of entities, which can be uh, uh, which do a huge amount of computers. They all say this data has been submitted at this point in time, and then the next block comes along, and it makes. It makes sure, it proves to you that this data in that block has not been changed. That's actually what you probably need to remember about a blockchain. It is, every block contains data that a lot of people, a lot of entities, I need to say computers, have seen at a certain time and that is not falsifiable. So nobody can come in into a blockchain and say, I'm going to change this because you can't. With that, starting from that, uh, from that premise, you can do a lot of other things than just move, uh, move a certain token around as payment. It's a, it's a very strong one, because this is the double spend problem. Eh? You can say, this hasn't happened before, so this coin cannot be spent again. So that's the currency part. But what can you do, what more could you do? Well, first thing that people realized, and, and Next has built this, is you can you we call it a coin but it's actually a token like for instance a poker token has the form of a coin but it has nothing on it so unless it has fifty dollars on it or one dollar on it it's not worth anything it's it's something we agree on when we play poker for instance so that token takes a different value okay on that premise you can say let's call it anything we want and start trading anything we want and hey presto we have a decentralized marketplace asset where we can exchange assets this is what next does it has an asset exchange and the asset exchange is a decentralized token machine it allows you to create different tokens on the nxt blockchain and trade them between people and this trade is not centralized so if i now trade for instance well any trading system where you buy something is centralized in service for next this is done on the blockchain again so each block is no one gets in between you and the buyer this is the system allows you to do this trade on the next blockchain uh, one of the main ways that these tokens are used are, for instance, in uh, well, what people call crypto shares. So this can be crowdfunded projects uh, where people raise money by selling these tokens. And these tokens then represent, uh, for instance, ownership in a certain uh, venture. And this can be a startup, this can be an existing thing. We have people who have a brick and mortar business who, for a very specific project, raise money with this. So it's a decentralized way of doing crowdfunding, but at the same time also involving the people who are donating to your project. Because like Liaf or, uh, Lior or Liaf is his online name, so sorry. <laughs> this is a weird thing when you are in crypto. Uh, Lior here um, already explained that if you have a vote and you give someone a token, you can give them that vote. But if you have a token in your account and I want to know, I have made profit in my business, for instance, and I want to distribute this profit, a percentage of it, to these people, I can just send it to the people holding those tokens. Per token, I give them this, this many next, and it's all automatic. Thus, so this makes it very easy to create a situation, uh, create an, a small organization where you involve everyone. The same goes for the vote. If somebody has bought into my, for instance, my uh, project, I can give them control. I can choose to give them control over my project. I can put up votes. And then I can get the results of the votes. And for instance, the money raised in my project, I put down four projects that I can do with this money and people choose and I will do this. Personally, I think this would be for small charities, this would be an enormous use case because one of the problems that we see with charities is that the money, the way that money is handled is people don't trust it anymore. 
So if you can do it in this way, where everybody knows there is no cheating anymore, I think it can be a very strong case to make people empowered about their donations again, but also give trust back to the charities by them automating via the blockchain these kinds of votes. The asset exchange also can be used for many other things. People have, you have membership tokens you can create. Anything that you, do you can uh, think of that you could write on a poker chip and trade between people, you can do digitally and decentralized on our asset exchange. It's been running since April 2013 already. See, uh, uh, top of my, 14, yes. Top of my head, 693 assets are at this moment created on the asset exchange, of which I think 150 are actively traded between people for many different things. They can even have almost no value, of course. I remember one of the first use cases is that people created the love asset, which meant that if you liked a post by somebody on the forum, you could send them some love. It can also be cute and nice, but again, it uses this way and it turned out in the end that this actually became valuable, so these people were very happy. This is a small list of what would be possible on the asset exchange. So you could do private equities or public equities, commodities, anything. A commo it's possible to create unique assets. So this means that you, for instance, could trade cars on it, because every asset represents that specific car. You could even use it in a different way. If you put a code connected to that specific asset, you could use it as a key. Because if you then prove ownership of this asset, if you could prove this and make this into software, you could start your car with it. Because it makes certain that this is your ownership. Imagine how easy it is to sell your car. You can just put it on the asset exchange for sale, boom. And, it, and the ownership goes to another owner who can just start his car immediately with this token. The idea behind all these blockchain things, uh, blockchain products, is to take out in the intermediaries. Not because intermediaries are inherently bad, but because it is a position of power that they, that they could misuse. And you, there is a lot of talk about the trustlessness of the system. And it doesn't mean that you don't trust people. It means that you don't need to trust them. And this is something uh, that's really important about blockchain. There is no need anymore to trust these people. So for instance, uh, one of the, I think the most uh, recent uh, phases where you could see that this where things can go wrong is MasterCard. Um, anybody remember WikiLeaks? At a certain point we had WikiLeaks, Julian Assange did a lot of things that the US government wasn't happy with, but they asked for donations. They got, a lot, they got donations and then MasterCard decided we are not doing any donations anymore, we will block every transaction for donations against WikiLeaks. And this is a really weird thing to happen. You have a private company here, which is a new, which is supposed to be a neutral company, which is taking political stance. And that's where these kinds of things become really important, because you get political, uh, political decisions mixed up with business decisions. MasterCard, before that, was a neutral, uh, supposedly at least, a neutral company. And you would expect that from somebody who provides you a service. You are not expecting that company to come in and make a comment by blocking you and possibly even uh, giving your name to, to whatever agency, because you don't know this, to come in and block this and say you cannot do this while it's your money and you're a member. This, so it's not about not trusting them, it's about not having to trust them anymore. With Next or Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, you can make this transaction because it's your value and you can do with it what you want. So all these things that, that we're doing here, you can put on that level. It's, it's a choice. Different things, vouchers, software licensing, voting rights, like I said, anything you can think on on a poker chip. 